in vain. D.K. Chesterton says, miracles are simply the liberty of God. Just as God has given us free will, he also has free will and may do as he pleases. And occasionally it pleases him to make exceptions to the natural order that he has created. Miracles are exceptional, and if they're not exceptional, then they're not miraculous. We are free to believe or disbelieve in them. Ironically, it is we narrow-minded Christians who are so restricted in our thinking who believe in miracles, whereas it is the open-minded liberal thinkers who find that they are not free to believe in miracles. They need to disbelieve in miracles in order to maintain their disbelief in the Christian faith. But they usually do not stop there. Not only won't they believe in miracles themselves, they don't want Christians or anyone else to be free to believe in miracles. They want to debunk the miracles because they want to debunk the faith. And it's not because they don't have a faith, but rather because they do. They have a faith in materialism. Chesterton says that a miracle is an event that means materialism is nonsense. And he says, I do what no materialist can do. I take miracles lightly. But the materialist cannot do that. It's actually more important for him to disprove the miracle than it is for the Christian to prove it. The Christian's faith remains intact, miracle or no miracle. But the materialist's faith is destroyed by a genuine miracle. And so the materialist will go through great lengths to come up with a natural explanation for what appears to be a supernatural event. Chesterton takes this idea, the idea of the miracle destroying a materialist's belief and does something very interesting with it in a series of Father Brown stories. We're going to take a look at one. We uh, won't tell you which one it is though. Here's the setup. While Father Brown is visiting America, he comes to the office of a rich man wanting to see him. But the man's secretary and two other business associates are standing outside the door of his sixth floor office explaining that the man is alone and not to be disturbed. Father Brown tells them that he merely wants to see the man and see if he's okay because he's just heard someone curse the man. They laugh at Father Brown because each of them is a religious skeptic. But when they finally enter the office, they're shocked to find it empty. They later discover the man hanging from a tree on the other side of the office building. The three gentlemen can do nothing to explain the strange death. It's a classic locked room mystery. And the only solution that they can come up with is that somehow the man was killed by a supernatural curse, the curse that Father Brown heard. They give an account of what happened, but no one will believe them. The police they think they're leaving out some of the facts. A psychologist thinks that Father Brown has played some psychological trick on them. And they finally decide that they're going to sign a sworn affidavit testifying to the miraculous event. Father Brown's miracle may be miraculous or no, but he said it would happen, and it did happen. All these blasted cranks can do is see a thing happen and then say it didn't. I think we owe it to the Padre to testify to his little demonstration. We are all sane, solid men who never believed in anything. We weren't drunk. We weren't devout. It simply happened, just as he said it. I quite agree. It may be the beginning of mighty big things in the spiritual line. But anyhow, the fellow who's in the spiritual line himself, Father Brown, has certainly scored over this business. <laughs> Father Brown. Father Brown, we ask you here in the first place to offer our apologies and our thanks. We recognize that it was you who spotted the spiritual manifestation from the first. We were hard-shelled skeptics. But now, we realize that a man must break through that shell to get at the, the great things behind the world. Now, you stand for those things. You stand for that supernormal explanation of things. And we have to hand it to you. And in the second place, we feel that this document would not be complete 
without your signature. We are notifying the exact facts to the Psychical Research Society because the newspaper accounts are not what you would call exact. We've stated how the curse was spoken in the street, how the man was sealed in this room like a box, how the curse dissolved him straight into thin air, and in some unthinkable way, materialized him as a suicide on a gallows. That's all we can say about it, but all we know and all we've seen with our own eyes. And since you were the first to believe in the miracle, we think you should be the first to sign. No, <clears throat> no, really, I don't think I should like to do that. What? You don't want to sign first. I mean, uh, I'd rather not sign at all. You see, it doesn't quite do for a man in my position to joke about miracles. But it was you who said it was a miracle. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid there's some mistake. I don't think I ever said it was a miracle. All I said was that it might happen. You said that it couldn't happen, because it would be a miracle if it did, and then it did. So you said it was a miracle. But I never said a word about miracles or magic or anything of the sort from beginning to end. But I thought you believed in miracles. Yes, I believe in miracles. I believe in man-eating tigers, but I don't see them running about everywhere. If I want any miracles, I know where to get them. I can't understand your taking this line, Father Brown. It seems so narrow. You don't look narrow to me, though you are a parson. Don't you see that a miracle like this will knock all materialism in ways? It'll just tell the whole world in big print that spiritual powers can work and do work. You'll be serving religion as no parson ever served it yet. Well, you wouldn't suggest that I serve religion by what I know to be a lie. I don't know precisely what you mean by the phrase, and to be quite candid, I'm not sure you do. Lying may be serving religion. I'm sure it's not serving God. And since you've been harping so incessantly on what I believe, wouldn't it be well to have some notion of what it is? I don't think I quite understand. I don't think you do. And Father Brown proceeds to tell them the real solution to the mystery which we're not going to tell you. But we can tell you that it was a perfectly natural explanation and not at all miraculous. Oh. Well, I never... By the way, don't think I blame you for jumping to preternatural conclusions. The reason's very simple, really. You all swore you were hard-shelled materialists. And as a matter of fact, you were all balanced on the very edge of belief, a belief in almost anything. There are thousands balanced on it today, but it is a sharp, an uncomfortable edge to sit on. You won't rest till you believe something. That's why you went through new religions with a tooth comb. And you quote scripture for your religion of breathing exercises. And you grumble at the very God you deny. That's where you all split. It's natural to believe in the supernatural. It never feels natural to accept only natural things. And though it only took a touch to tip you into preternaturalism about these things, these things really were only natural things. They were not only natural, they were almost unnaturally simple. In another Father Brown story, the little priest detective says that the modern mind always mixes up two different ideas, mystery in the sense of what is marvelous and mystery in the sense of what is complicated. That's half the difficulty about miracles. A miracle is startling, but it is simple. It is simple because it is a miracle. It is power coming directly from God or from the devil instead of in indirectly through nature or human wills. But there are other mysteries which are startling that can be explained even if they are 
difficult to explain. In his debates, in his mystery stories, in his books and journalism, Chesterton uses evidence and reason to make two important points about miracles. First, miracles happen, and second, the noble miracles are found in the history of the Catholic Church. While there are indeed people who are ready to believe anything, the Church is not interested in cheap miracles for publicity purposes, or for that matter, any miracles for publicity purposes. Jesus himself warned that a wicked and adulterous generation seeks signs and wonders. And the fact is, though there are signs and wonders to be seen in many places, unbelievers and scoffers and skeptics still won't believe. It's not a matter of evidence, it's a matter of sin, and looking for more excuses not to repent. I'm Dale Alquist. Please join us again for the Apostle of Common Sense.